Okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us today at the Aspen Institute. My name is Ross Wiener. I'm the Executive Director of the Aspen Institute Education and Society Program, and uh, delighted that you're joining us uh, for this afternoon's uh, book talk and conversation. Uh, we're incredibly lucky today with uh, just a, a really a great group of, of leaders and thinkers who are going to help us um, think about the issues, opportunities, and challenges of rural education in America. Uh, I will introduce folks in just a second. Um, but first, just a couple of things as, as we get uh, into today's event. One, I want everybody to prepare the questions that you have, the things you want to talk about. We were definitely going to leave some good time for that today. So please, thinking about, please think about what you want to contribute to the conversation. If you want to share what you want to contribute to the conversation, with the broader world through social media, uh, please use the hashtag rural schools. Um, and also feel free to, to tag our panelists as well. Their Twitter handles uh, are up on the screen and they'll stay there throughout the event. Um, and now um, let, me, let me do a little bit of context then I will introduce our panelists. Um, so the Aspen Institute Education and Society Program uh, really convenes education leaders for conversations about how to improve public education. And we find that, you know, educators have such incredibly important jobs, system leaders, policymakers, work of improving education is so critical um, and so challenging and often leaders in this work are isolated. They have so much responsibility, they have to project so much confidence into their work, into their systems, that they also just need spaces to be in conversation, be in dialogue with others, really sort of um, be able to put questions on the table and not always uh, to project. So most of our work is off the record conversations, uh, but we also um, then like to elevate these issues and conversations for, for public discourse as well. I mean, we do, we really, there's a couple of issues that are sort of signature things that we focus on. And one of them uh, for the last several years has really been around equity. How do we make sure that public education is responding and providing the opportunities and the resources and the expectations for every young person. And that doesn't mean everybody gets the same. That means everybody gets what they need. And, and I will say, right, we've taken a, a, we've done a deep dive in the urban context and what are the equity issues that arise in urban school districts. We run a network of urban superintendents and their chief academic officers and chiefs of schools. And I think one of the things that we're trying to do with this conversation and with the relationships we have with these leaders is to make sure that we're also looking into how do equity issues present and what needs to be addressed in rural as well. And I will say we were just in a conversation earlier this morning. One of the things we've tried to bring uh, into conversations around equity is that, yes, it's about reading and math achievement. It's also about every young person having a, 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 an education that lets them become their best selves and that helps them to develop a healthy identity and a sense of their place in the community. And one of the things that we talked about this morning is that one of the things we've focused on in our program is how much race and ethnicity affects identity development and needs to be considered in how we uh, address educational issues. Place also uh, is, is sort of uh, deeply a part of people's identity um, and ought to be uh, affirmed and, and, and respected and now part of their education as well. And so a chance to think about how do equity issues show up in rural America. One of the other things that we try to do in the Education and Society program is to transcend some of the divides that are just making our political discourse uh, so divisive. Um, and that's about bringing different voices to the table. And I think you can't, you can't work through, you can't transcend those divides if you're not in relationship with people who have different perspectives, different experiences. So it's also about making sure, right, in Washington, we have a certain conversation uh, and certain things that are always getting a priority and making sure uh, that we're also bringing in different voices, different perspectives to that conversation all the time. It's something that we're trying to do ourselves and trying to bring again to the public conversation. And so uh, when Andy Smerick published uh, this book with a partner, No Longer Forgotten, Right, uh, just the title itself calls you uh, to invest and reflect on on your own on on our own work. Certainly, uh, was something that we saw when we uh, when we saw the book and then read it together. Um, thought about right, 
issues of rural America need as much attention as urban and suburban, but we just don't get those folks in our conversations all the time. We don't put it forward. So really delighted for today's conversation. So let me go ahead and introduce our panelists today, um, and then I'll invite Andy up. So just to my right, uh, is Sanford Johnson. He's the Deputy Director of Mississippi First, uh, an advocacy organization in Mississippi. Um, to Sanford's right, Jillian Balo is the Superintendent of Public Instruction for Wyoming, uh, a statewide uh, elected official. Uh, and to her right, Kirsten Baszler, also a statewide elected official, the Superintendent of Public Instruction for the state of North Dakota. Um, and both are active uh, at the national level uh, with the Council of Chief State School Officers, and again, leading on rural issues and bringing that into the national conversation. I just want to thank our partners at CCSSO. We we're so lucky this week, the state chiefs were meeting here in DC, and so we decided uh, to do this book talk today so that we could get their perspectives on this panel as well. And then um, Andy Smerick is the Director of Civil Society Education and Work at the R Street Institute, and one of the editors of no longer forgotten the triumphs and struggles of rural education in America. Uh, so thank you, Andy, for your work uh, and for coming today uh, to sponsor this conversation. So please, if you'd kick us off. Great. Thank you. Uh, well, first of all, uh, a huge thanks to Aspen um, for hosting this. Um, the Aspen Institute has been important for generations, bringing people together to have kinds of conversations, people of goodwill trying to figure out the big social problems that we deal with. And I think in this moment in particular, when our politics is, can be so nasty, um, Aspen has a particularly important role. So thank you to all the people who put this together. And thanks to, of course, Ross and Abigail and Danielle and the education team for hosting this. So um, I'm going to spend about 10, 12 minutes just talking generally about this book, try to be a little bit provocative so we can have a good conversation. So by way of background, for almost 20 years now, I've been doing education-related stuff in and around the field. And it's always been surprising or noticeable, conspicuous, that rural education issues don't possibly mean as often as they might. So the question becomes, why? Well, obviously, urban education issues are important. Um, concentrated poverty, our cities are very important for whole lots of reasons. Lots of kids need help there. Um, so we, we should recognize that there's a reason why that has got prioritized. But we also, I think, have to recognize that we, all of us, are in a city right now. Think tanks are generally in cities. Governments are based in cities. Philanthropies are in cities. The big major newspapers are in cities. The people who work for all of these types of organizations generally work in or around cities. And this is not to castigate anyone, but it's true of all of us. We like to work on and do the things that we know and that are around us. So bias is often a word that uh, has a negative connotation, but I just think I want to talk about the fact that we have a bias in education often because the people leading it um, have a city-centric view. And that's not a bad thing. Lots of Kids have been well served because of that, but I think it has left some things out. As a matter of fact, it's had two big influences during at least my career, call it the last 20, 25, 30 years, on how we've thought about education policy. The first is, of course, the enormous amount of energy well spent on urban education issues, charter schools, and vouchers, and tax credits, and state takeovers of schools and districts, and the big fights between unions and management. All that is important, and kids have been better served, I think, because we've spent a lot of energy there, but it's consumed a whole lot of oxygen. Then we've also, because of the NCLB and then the Obama administration's um, kind of push and some other things that have happened in the zeitgeist, we've developed what many people call the statewide unified approach to education reform, where state governments take on a set of reforms that are meant to apply equally across a state. Think of statewide standards, statewide tests, statewide teacher evaluation reform, statewide approaches to longitudinal data systems, statewide approaches to um, turnarounds of low-performing schools. Again, all these things are good, but anytime you do anything in a unified, unitary way, what that has a tendency to do is pinch or at least ill-fit the areas that are not like the others. So you can see these two big thrusts on the former urban education reform, it just kind of totally ignored rural America. And on the statewide uh, reform, some of them were good, but also not all of them fit well um, in the same way they would fit on suburban or um, urban communities on rural areas. 
And so what I learned, I've had a handful of jobs in state government, including uh, two different states, one State Department of Education, one State Board of Education. Happy to tell war stories about these issues if you would like, but the biggest thing I kind of came ar around to was that often the narratives that were dominant in the newspapers, coming out of think tanks, coming out of research organizations, were just different than the conversations I was having when a state has to engage urban, suburban, and rural communities together. There was a disconnect that um, I felt sometimes the conversations we were generally having had, and to be diplomatic here, uh, just an, a misunderstanding or lack of understanding of the needs, the context, the history, the culture of a broad swath of America, rural America. Okay, so that's the context. Let me get now into some details why we put this book together. Um, this is meant to give you a sense of the differences in rural America and why some of them are important and might want to think about shaping your work or the, your partner's work. So did you know that almost 10 million boys and girls are in rural schools today? That's about 20% of all K-12 students in general. Now, there are lots of different definitions for what counts as rural. There are dozens of them actually uh, under different federal programs. Uh, uh, rather than getting into all of them, generally they capture two things. One, rural is not a city. Typically, it's a remove from a city by some distance, but also it's sparsely populated. What becomes curious about this, though, is then the term rural, and you can see my air quotes here, captures very, 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 very different parts of America. Rural captures the Deep South with the history of slavery and segregation, captures Appalachia with a very different history, captures parts of New England, captures the Northern Plains, captures the de Desert Southwest. All of these places have different histories, different cultures, different needs, but they're all considered rural. So there's a certain danger in just looking at these all as the exact same. With that said, there are a number of really important similarities that come about because of the move geographically and politically, which I'll come back to in a second, um, but because they're sparsely populated. So let me give you a couple of those. Rural students, no matter where they are, um, go to fewer libraries, museums, and concerts than students in any other geography. Why? There are just fewer of them where they actually live. Uh, AP, advanced placement, fewer than two-thirds of high schools in rural areas have access to any AP classes. In suburban areas, it's north of 90%. Rural high school students also have less access to uh, foreign language programs, specialty schools, and a range of enrichment programs, often largely just because of lack of capacity, uh, lack of uh, dense population. Now, this other part is seldom talked about, but it's through the research, something that really stood out to me, is that often in rural communities, the school, the public school, is the social institution. It is the thing around which an entire community gathers, um, often because it is so important, and I'm gonna get to some of the reasons why, but also just because there is not much else. So it is the thing where you, where you go to um, do bake sales, to gather on Friday nights for a game, to do volunteer activities. If there's an emergency, that is where you go. It is the thing that is ours in a community. Um, and rural families often love, love, love their schools. It is part of them. So a lot of the language that we have used over the past couple decades about failing schools lands particularly badly on rural communities because to them, a school is the community in a very unique way. So the language there can be very important. And there's one last thing that we have to point out. The shadow of consolidation and closure hangs over lots of rural communities in a profound way. Um, most other places in the suburbs don't much have to worry about their schools closing or being consolidated. A lot of rural communities worry if we lose five more families in the next couple years, our school will be closed. And if our school is closed, the next closest one is 50 miles away. And if people have to get on a bus 50 miles to go to a school, maybe our town is going to die. Uh, so these issues are front and center for lots of families. Now onto the academics. Rather than going into all the details about NAEP scores and state test scores, in general, rural schools um, look a lot like suburban and urban. Um, there's some achievement gaps, uh, aggregate levels of performance not too dissimilar. But what's most interesting is that rural schools have remarkably high graduation rates from high school, but remarkably low rates of college going. Let me repeat that. Um, unusually high high school graduation, unusually low college going. 
compared to these other geographies. So why in the world would that be the case? Lots of possible explanations. One is just distance. If you're in a rural community, you're probably a whole lot further away from institutions of higher education, especially if you're low income, that makes a difference. But there's more. In many rural communities, jobs of the past, jobs of the current, maybe jobs of the future are tied to the land or the water nearby, mining, agriculture, um, drilling. Many of those jobs in the past and maybe to the future don't require a college degree. And that leads to this really interesting phenomenon. Adults in rural areas have fewer college degrees than even urban families or suburban. Parents of urban kids have less expectations of their kids going to college compared to families in cities or in the suburbs. Even rural superintendents actually prioritize less in terms of what is important than urban superintendents that their students are on a path to college. Interesting, right? Not like they don't love their kids, but they view college differently. And part of it is this very different, difficult moral issue that we should get into related to what some people call the brain drain. That is, if you are a small rural community and um, you worry about your school closing, you worry about the population of your city, your town going away, if you really well educate a bunch of your kids and your 20 best and brightest every year go off to a college in another place, they very well may not come back after they see the amenities, the job opportunities elsewhere. And if every single year you're losing your 20 best and brightest year after year after year and you're already worried about the demographics of your town it going away, it puts business leaders, it puts town leaders, it puts educators in a really awkward position. What is the kids of their families of this town when it comes to education? Now, for someone who's been doing a lot of this work for a long time, I used to think I knew what education success looks like. Graduation rates, college going, test scores. This complicates things, right? Is it successful if a town sends all of their kids to a college far away and they never come back and the town is gone in 20 years? I'm not so sure. Now, uh, let me just go into a couple of the struggles that you may not know about that are pretty brutal. Did you know that 85%, 85% of America's persistently poor counties are rural? These are the counties where generation after generation, people live in poverty. Poverty is the stickiest. 85% of them in America are actually in rural areas, not in urban. We have an entire chapter dedicated to um, the opioid addiction crisis and the deaths of despair that come along with this. I would recommend this to you. It was, of all the things I read in this book, um, it was the most staggering. The impact of dozens, or in some cases, hundreds of parents being addicted to opioids, um, overdosing over the weekend, and what that does to kids and to their schools, uh, it's, it's heartrending. It is also the case today that 18 to 24 year olds in rural America have the highest rate of what we call being idle, neither in work nor in school. Higher than in urban areas, higher than in suburban areas. And now get this, 45% of high school dropouts in rural America today are idle, neither working, so not in the workforce, unemployed, um, and not in school, 45%. So all of these things can make recruitment of teachers even more difficult. Um, it's hard to get a teacher to come into the area if there are fewer amenities, if you're far away from things, if you have a spouse and he or she can't really get a job in the rural area because there aren't many other industries. And that leads to, unsurprisingly, these phenomenon. For example, rural teachers are less likely to have a degree from a selective college or university. They're also less likely to have a master's degree. Now, this getting into some things that I find really interesting because they're cultural. In rural America, they view themselves as being cohesive when it comes to values. That is, in surveys, um, rural communities will say, people in my community share my values. They are more likely to say that than families who are in suburbia or in urban areas. They're also more likely to say that people in cities do not share their values. This becomes even more interesting because there's a political element. 91% of America's remote rural school districts, 91% were in counties that voted for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton in 2016. So let me kind of put these pieces together for you. Rural areas are at a remove geographically. 
they view themselves often um, philosophically at a remove from cities. Politically, we see that they're at a remove. And yet, earlier on, I told you we all recognize that the think tanks are in cities, and all the money is in cities, and policymakers are in cities. This kind of distance actually is meaningful, the policies that we make, that there's both figurative and literal distance between these communities. Now, just to finish up, there's some assets that we should talk about, or at least be aware of. One is that in rural communities to this day, marriage rates are still higher, often considerably higher. Kids are more likely to grow up in two-parent families if you live in rural America. You're more likely to have a parent stay at home with you as a child from the time you're born to the time you go to school. Parents are more engaged in school activities, in community activities, and in church activities on average in rural America. So there's some good things going on. I've given you as many data points as I can in 12 minutes in the book. Lots of other interesting stuff in here related to uh, property taxes and the politics of these places. But let me just end maybe to get the conversation going with three nudges or recommendations that I have um, for anyone who kind of works in education. The first is this. Um, I've come to the conclusion, because rural America and rural schools are so different, that we should stop as education organizations trying to jam a rural agenda underneath some other agenda we have. Say, oh, our equity agenda can encapsulate rural stuff, or our statewide agenda can encapsulate rural stuff. I think the differences are so meaningful that it behooves us to actually say out loud, this is our rural agenda, because these places are different and they deserve attention. The second is a lot of organizations simply don't have anyone on staff who grew up in a rural area. They often don't have any staff who live in rural areas. And so if we believe in the value of diversity, meaning different people from different experiences can um, make sure that we don't have blind spots, maybe we should add to our definition of diversity when we're hiring in education organizations, making sure that we at least are aware. Does everyone who worked for us, did they grow up in the leafy suburbs or cities? Do we have anyone who knows about the Deep South or the um, uh, Upper Plains or Appalachia? It's worth asking. And then the last thing is I'm an advocate in general for getting people who do education policy work to go work for state governments, but it's particularly apt here. I never learned more about um, rural issues or how rural issues engage with other kinds of issues than when you're in a state legislature or in a governor's office or with the state board of education or a state department of education. Because while think tanks and researchers and advocates are talking about the issues they care about, when you are in a state and people have to figure out a funding formula and a charter school law and something about teacher certification, that is when all of these issues come together and you have to be fair to everyone and navigate things, litigate things, and adjudicate them. Um, and you realize ultimately what comes out the other end was a matter of compromise. And I think it would behoove all of us if we um, did some work at the state level so we could kind of become familiar with the politics and policy of this and realize how important and difficult some of these issues are. So with that, I will stop. Good. Awesome, thank you guys. So appreciate that, uh, th those remarks, and I hope they've, again, elicited some ideas about things you want to get talking about, but I'm going to engage our panelists and you, Andy, uh, for a little bit first. And so you closed by saying you thought that uh, state leadership was a really important context for better understanding. And we have uh, folks here who have committed their work. They, are, they, are, they have come out of the classroom, out of schools, uh, but are now in state leadership positions. And so uh, just a great context for learning and exploring these issues. And so, Kirsten, I'm going to start with you, and, and we'll go down the line. And I think, you know, we talked about that right, rural and so it, it is defined by place. Um, and so I would love for you to, to sort of introduce, introduce yourself and, and your perspective on these issues to the group by telling a story about a particular place that taught you something about the opportunity, the greatness uh, of education in, in rural America and possibly some of the, the challenges or issues that need to be addressed as well. Certainly, thank you, Ross, and thank you to to uh, Aspen, to Andy. You just so much to respond to, yeah. in that I just Sorry. no, it was wonderful, <laughs> fabulous. Um, but yes, so at the state level, it's completely different. Um, as Ross mentioned, I am from North Dakota, and and I understand place very well. And I thought I had an understanding uh, as a young person who went to a, a school district that was considered rural. 
I had 28 students in my graduating class. And essentially, they were the tw same 28 students that I started kindergarten with. And so I thought I had a deep understanding of what rural was and what North Dakota was. And it's amazing to me that I'm even able to say this now because once I came to the state superintendent's role, I realized that there was so much about rural North Dakota that even I didn't know. And for those of you that have known me before and talked to me before, I often describe North Dakota as one community with a really long main street because we are all so interconnected and it's a small cohesive community and it doesn't take long to get um, the, the uh, 300 miles from one end to the other end because we have you know amazing roadways and, and thoroughfares. But, but there is so much that I didn't know. And so I think one of the very first experiences uh, when I was the state superintendent was I when I was trying to get feedback on one of our state accountability plans, and I needed to do some consultation and some engagement. And so what do I do as a state leader? We have these big rooms at the Capitol. You reserve one of those rooms, and you invite everyone to come to the Capitol to engage with you and, and to consult with you on what their thoughts are and what their input is. And then I realized that some of these uh, people that I had been inviting would need to travel for five hours in order for me to, to engage with them. And that was voiced very clearly at this first engagement, first, con first consultation meeting. And I had to recalibrate a little bit, and I had to recalibrate a lot. <laughs> and so then I you know, started to travel all around and schedule the meetings in their locations. And not just eight regional locations, but 16, 20, 25 different meetings in every corner of our state. Uh, and I would pull into one of our school communities. And I grew up in a small town. I, I knew I had a cafe. I knew I had a, a grocery store. So I expected that that was my context. Well, I pulled into some of these communities. And there was no cafe. And there was no grocery store. The, the, the nearest super center was 190, 110 miles away. And that's significantly <clears throat> different. And then I realized that not only did they not have a super center or a cafe or a grocery store, they didn't have banking services either. So then I start to think about financial literacy and the context. And all of us as educators know, know, know in, instinctively that you can't teach a new concept until you have a prior concept to attach that to. So as we're trying to teach all of these new things, what prior context and where is that gap, where is that desert, if you will, of these students? Um, I will tell you that when you talked about the, the number of libraries and the number of concerts, what I really significantly understood then is that we have an opportunity desert in some of our communities. We certainly do not have um, the capacity or the academic skill or the, the ability desert, but we have an opportunity desert. Because I think one thing that I would like to share is about my, school, my smallest school district. I have 178 school districts in the state of North Dakota. 129 of those school districts have zero to 300 students pre-K through 12. So the majority of my schools are the rural schools that we're talking about and rural and isolated. Horse Creek, or depending on which part of North Dakota you live in, it could be Horse Creek. Um, but they have eight students, and they are two families. They're cousins. And so they are, um, they're just too far away. This, this Horse Creek School is just too far away to go to the next school down the road. It's over an hour away. And so it's just not a possibility. But there's also something that goes along with what Andy talked about with the pride, the culture and of, um, I, I don't want us to assume that rural means poverty because this is a particular school district um, that is, is very wealthy and in their terms of both not, not wealthy and like the top 1% wealthy, but North Dakota is, they, they produce a majority of the world's food, not just the nation's food, but the world's food. We also have a very, very relevant and robust energy sector. We also have the second largest Microsoft campus in Fargo in, this, in the nation. So um, rural does not always mean poverty, but the, where these jobs are, where these opportunities are to make a great living, whether it be a dairy farm or a, a grains farm or in our energy sector, they're located in rural communities. And so they are, there are people that have chosen to raise their families there, go off, get a degree or not, but can be very viably employed. And that's where they're raising their children. And, and we are very fortunate to have three generations living on the same homestead. And so not only do you have two parent families, but you have um, grandma and grandpa, and maybe your aunt and uncle and your cousins that live right down the road. And so that is something very, very important about the success of our students. And so I think we do have very significant areas of poverty that are rural, but I just, I, I don't want us to talk about the, the idea of rural schools as one and the same with poverty. Great, thank you. 
Wow, thank you, Kirsten. That was um, that was amazing, and I could almost say ditto to everything um, in terms of what's happening in Wyoming. I'm a fifth generation Wyomingite, so I'm one generation away from being considered not local. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also attended school in one of our largest districts in Wyoming and taught school in one of our smallest districts in Wyoming. And the experience was very, very, very different, um, obviously being a student versus a teacher, but just in terms of the opportunities for students. So oftentimes, um, I guess I'll bookend this with just saying, oftentimes we talk about um, access to quality opportunities for students. And in rural Wyoming, we're, we just want to focus on access, access to some, base, some basic needs getting prescriptions, access to doctors, access to fresh food. Um, and and um, interestingly, the citizens in smaller communities don't recognize that as any more than a daily hurdle, um, kind of like getting up if you're not a morning person. It's just <laughs> part of life. And everyone really rallies around that. So while that is a, a, a huge hurdle, um, it's also the, the resilience and, and um, and the pride in the community is also uh, the, the wonderful part about rural education and rural communities. So maybe the best way to illustrate that is, is uh, to talk just a little bit about my experience that I spent in a rural community as a teacher where my husband was also the principal. And um, so I taught 7th, 8th, 10th, 11th, and 12th grade. And I taught language arts, and some of those kids I had for more than one, uh, one period a day for a variety of different reasons. I also coached volleyball, um, and I taught the fitness class after school on Tuesdays to the teachers, and was the eighth grade sponsor. So the opportunity that we have to just be really close-knit with other very noble and wonderful people is pretty incredible. And that really translates to the connections that students get to make to their teachers and to other community members. So by contrast, um, my husband was the principal, and he was also the head boys basketball coach. And the head custodian was also the bus driver. So it would not be out of sorts to have the bus driver gone with a group of students and my husband coaching football, being, or excuse me, coaching basketball and being the principal and sweeping the court during halftime while I was in the concession stand with my eighth graders selling treats. That's just the way we do it. And that's not anything special that we did. Anyone in a rural community could, could say, these are the hats that I wear. And, um, and again, while to some that may look like a real hurdle, and it is, um, you know, it, it certainly lends to, um, to poverty and again, that access to quality. It's also a great strength of the community and really um, a, a, a great uh, marker of the resilience that exists in, in rural communities across the state. So I can't imagine doing the job as state superintendent uh, in Wyoming without having that context because we have a couple of larger school districts with our largest is about 13 to 14,000 students. And then we have rural and then, it, and then we have rural-er. <laughs> mm. and, um, and those are three really different classifications. And every issue, every problem, every solution not only um, lacks a statewide solution or a statewide approach, but also we need to think of a small, medium, and large district in the context of rural Wyoming. And, um, and so the, the issues may be the same, in many cases they are, but the lens is very, very different, and the lens in rural states is, um, is critical. You can't approach it from, uh, you know, I, I think we just sort of automatically adapt anything that comes from a, the federal level and say, how does that look in Wyoming? How does that look in North Dakota? Those are the, the crux of conversations that I have with our federal delegation. Um, Senator Enzi was a, a, a stalwart supporter of the Perkins reauthorization, and that's what the conversations looked, looked like. This seems like a good idea, Jillian, but what does this look like in Wyoming? What does this look like in our smaller schools? So constantly applying a different lens to every single thing to make sure that it works for our most rural students. Terrific. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I um, hail from Clarksdale, Mississippi. 
in the Delta. Uh, this is also the week of Juke Joint Festival, so in terms of, in terms of concerts, we're set, we're good. Um, <laughs> I was born in the Mississippi Delta. My father was a uh, teacher and professor there. My mother was the home economist with the extension of service. Um, they decided when my brother and I were young that in order to give us all the things that they wanted us to have as children, that we had to leave the Delta. So we moved to another part of the state. We moved to Starkville, um, one of the university towns in Mississippi and went through college, went through high school there for college. I was ready to get out of the state. I thought, okay, I'm done. I'll come back to visit, but getting far away from here. Um, thought I was done with Mississippi. If somebody would have told me that not only are you coming back to Mississippi, but you're gonna be in the Mississippi Delta, I might have hit them. Um, <laughs> but that's exactly what happened. I had an opportunity to come back right before I graduated from college, uh, working for a senator, uh, connected with a uh, hometown friend, a former uh, Bus 51 alum from Starkville. And uh, we ended up talking about some of the challenges in our state. And by the end of that summer, Mississippi was all that was on my mind. Like, I've got to get back, what do I need to do? Um, eventually uh, led me to Teach for America, and I taught in the Mississippi Delta, thought that, that was going to be two years, and then off to D.C., off to Capitol Hill, and 16 years later, um, still in the Delta, loving everything about it. Um, I feel like the, the work that I'm doing right now is really making a difference in a place that is often overlooked. Um, to talk about the impact of uh, well, what's happening in education right now, um, there was one thing that was in the, in the book that really stood out to me, was talking about challenges, but also talking about the successes as well. Um, before I got on the plane yesterday, um, I felt like this game that we play in the Johnson House called Pass the Bug, where somebody's sick, then somebody else gets sick. I felt like my turn was coming, so <laughs> I went to the urgent care clinic before I went to the airport. And this is the first time I went to this particular clinic in uh, Clarksdale, and I noticed that Anna, one of my students, was on the on the wall. She's one of the nurse practitioners there. And it was just, oh, that's my former pre U.S. history student. Uh, of course, she wasn't at work that day. Otherwise, it would have been a whole moment. But I have... So many of those experiences. I think that's one of the joys of still living in the community that I taught in. Like, sometimes you see a police officer. It's one of my second period students. Uh, one of the championship basketball coaches is a former student. The first lady of the church that I'm a member of is a former student. And mm -hmm. she asked me, like, right after she got installed, like, do I still have to call you Mr. Johnson? And like, not when you're the first lady of the church. I, you can be Sanford now. Um, <laughs> so there are a lot of challenges uh, when it comes down to education in Mississippi. We have a major uh, educator pipeline. So that's teachers as well as leaders trying to attract people. Uh, we have a lot of, we have a lot fewer people going into education in general. I think there's a 53% decline in the number of people who are getting their uh, certification mm -hmm. over the last five years. So we're not getting as many people into education. The ones that are going into education, they want to go to more attractive areas. They want to go to suburban Memphis, suburban Jackson, the Gulf Coast. It's hard to get people to want to go to Humphreys County, Leland, um, you know, other places in the Mississippi Delta. We often say in Mississippi that we have two cities. That's Memphis, Tennessee, and New Orleans, Louisiana. And uh, <laughs> this is where we tend, tend to lose a lot of our talent. Um, there are people all over the country that are doing great work that have some tie to the state. Either they taught in the Delta through Teach for America or Mississippi Teacher Corps, or either they grew up in Mississippi or their parents or their grandparents grew up in Mississippi. And there needs to be something that's said about that because when we're talking about, uh, when we're talking about black, black folks in Mississippi, we're talking about people of color, there are people who for generations thought that Mississippi is a place that you escape. And it's tough to have conversations trying to get people to come back to Mississippi. Like, you're doing this great work. Why don't you come back to Mississippi and doing that? But if your mindset is, like, my family escaped from Mississippi, why would I go back? That's something that we're trying to address right now. So that's a major challenge. Um, we also have some challenges around what school reform has looked like nationwide. And just like uh, Jillian was saying, how do we take some of these reform initiatives and try to translate them into something that could work in Mississippi. Like when we were doing school improvement grants, uh, I was one of the reviewers, and they gave you four options, and only one option was really viable in the state of Mississippi. Like, how are you gonna, how are you gonna replace half your staff? And not only is the talent not there, but like, that's my, that's my frat brother, that's my church member, that's my sister. Like, how, like there, there are certain relationships that it's hard to overcome. We also have some challenges around funding. Um, right now, we have a funding formula that is consistently underfunded, but even if it was fully funded every year, according to what the formula says, there's inequity that's baked into the formula, and the structure of it is completely unfair. Um, when it first 
came out in 1997, back when I was a senior in high school, you know, it addressed adequacy. But now that we know that the focus should be more on equity, it just does, does not provide enough funding for low-income students, for ELL students, uh, for rural students, for high school students. So there needs to be an overhaul of that. But we ran into a brick wall because everybody talks about more funding unless that means that you're going to be taking more money from affluent areas. Then we're like, wait, hold on now. We don't, we don't need to change this yet, yet because it, the formula works well for places that have a lot of property wealth. So these are the challenges that we have to address. But I also want to come back to the fact that even despite all these challenges, Anna's still a nurse practitioner, Corey is still coaching, Johnny's still a principal, I mean, uh, it's still a uh, police officer, they're educators, they're professors. Uh, there are a lot of good people that are coming out of the state. And my mindset is always, if we can improve the quality of education, in the, in the Delta or in the entire state of Mississippi, how can we produce more great people who can tell these great stories of people that I can see on the wall and be proud of? Thank you. Thank you, Sanford. And thank you to each of you. So we'll open it up now. Please uh, jump in. You know, I want to key off of uh, you, you shared, sort of described the statistics that there's significantly higher high school graduation rates and significantly lower college going rates. Um, and I want to complement that with two other statistics and just ask how you all see these things actually playing out in, in rural communities and how people are responding. So um, two thirds of rural counties lost population between 2010 and 2014. Two thirds of rural counties had a net decrease. And, and another statistic from the book, 60% of rural, parent, rural people responded to a survey saying they would tell their children actually to leave. So these are sobering things. And so I want to contrast that. Um, you, you talked about the brain drain. And so much of the national education reform conversation for the last decade or a little bit more has been around college and career readiness. But really around college readiness college. has been the thrust and what people have heard. There's now a real resurgence in career technical education and talking about pathways that are much more sort of set up to help people uh, really recognize how their education might uh, get them to a, a, a good job after school with some post-secondary not necessarily going to a four-year college. I'm just curious how you see these things. Have you heard rural communities that, uh, that, that bristle or push back at the sort of college for all agenda? It's been a real significant part of equity conversations, and yet in rural communities that may sound very different. So I'm just curious, how do you how do you approach those issues as leaders and as folks who are trying to make rural education uh, as vital and, 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 and you know, effective as it can be? Whenever I hear, if you, if you educate them, they'll leave, it, I cringe because of the sharecropper history of the Delta. So it's just like, no, no. Um, what I would say is that in healthy communities that I see, you do see people that leave, but these communities are also really good at attracting people as well. And I think that's what I saw when I lived in Starkville. There were a lot of people who left, left like you go off to Mississippi State or beyond, but you leave, and that's fine, but you're attracting families. So going all through from third grade all the way to high school, there were always these new families coming in. And I think that's what's missing in a lot of places in Mississippi, is that your best and brightest are going to try to leave for new opportunities, but we're not doing a good job of attracting those families. And if you can't attract, attract families, then you don't get the businesses. And if you don't get the businesses, then you can't attract more families. So I think it, uh, it really highlights the need to do everything we can to improve the quality of education to the point where we can attract more families. So, you know, folks who decide to work in Clarksdale, because you have folks that work in Clarksdale, but they live in Oxford, they live in suburban Memphis, they live an hour away, an hour and a half away, and they try to make that commute. So what do we need to do to make make sure that our communities are places where folks want to bring their family and bring all their things, mm -hmm. buy a house there, and like, you know, raise a family? Mm -hmm. I would think that's uh, that's point, very, very accurately said, Sanford. Um, I think it's about what you're offering in the community, what your state is offering, what your community is offering. Um, this is, you know, I'm sure North Carolina may be an anom anomaly, but, um, Two years ago, I believe we were the only state dominated by Gen Y. And that, is, and that is completely different than when I was raising my three sons. My oldest is 30 and my twins are 26. I really was of the generation of moms and dads that knew that eventually if their child would need to have a, a, a very 
uh, happy life that they would need to leave North Dakota because of the way that our economy was and job offerings and the opportunities that we had. Fortunately, the state did a lot of things to, to recalibrate who we were, to diverse, diversify our economies, and really um, intently set about making sure that we had something to offer. And now our students, my all of my children came back home actually to North Dakota because of the rural nature and where they wanted to eventually raise their families and the job opportunities were there. So it is very, very interconnected. I would also say that here's the challenge that I see in North Dakota is, is, really, is related to graduation rates and then college admissions or college entrance. What we see is we have a high graduation rate. We also have a high um, college first year rate. So the majority of our students go on to some sort of post-secondary. It's our retention rate and that we struggle with. And so that's this piece that I think we need to work with higher ed a little bit more. Our students coming from our rural settings or our smaller school districts are not experiencing the success and or the supports that are necessary for them to feel that they would be successful. A lot of that has to do, I mentioned earlier, our two research universities are on a Minnesota border, which you know, is a definite significant culture difference in Western North Dakota. Mm -hmm. And so I think those are some things that we need to address. To your uh, question, Ross, about did I feel pushback in North Dakota about the, the, the intentedness on, and the, the emphasis, and sometimes I would say overemphasis on just college ready? Absolutely I did. Because as I said, there's a, majority, there's, there's a large portion of our state that um, you know, felt that there was a lot of value in a lot of other different career paths, if you will. And we didn't do an, a good enough job, I think, of explaining that. But on the other hand, I think we struggle with our parents. When we, in high school and middle school, we do a really good job of advising our students about what is the opportunities are out there. And the state embraces that idea of different career paths. But then when it comes down to their son or their daughter, it's like, no, I meant somebody else's son, somebody <laughs> else's daughter. And mine need, to, my, mine need to go to the research university, or they need to go out of state. And so mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of, I mean, if we're going to be honest about things, I think there's a lot of fronts that we need to, to address. Can I just add one thing to this? Uh, I mean, there, there are some moral questions here. And um, just going to like back to first principles, the way I approach this is I think educators, systems of schools need to have as their first priority making sure that every single child has the opportunity to do what that child thinks is within his or her heart. Like allow that child to succeed, however they define that, as long as it is legal and moral and so on. So um, it would be wrong if a community decides that we're gonna prioritize the needs of the town over the needs of the child. Okay. However, the older I get, I also recognize that we are not atoms. Um, we are not widgets as human beings. Place is important to us. Community is important to us. Culture and history are important to us. Um, civil society is important to us. Uh, so when the economists say, there's not really a jobs problem. Um, yeah, people are out of work in Appalachia, but they could just get up and move to San Antonio or San Francisco. I think that misses this really important part of American history about pluralism, about culture and place and so forth. Uh, so I think it is morally sound for community leaders and educators to try to simultaneously educate their kids as best as possible, to give them uh, as broad horizons as possible, while recognizing that having this place for them to be, to feel rooted is important. And the best examples of this I've seen are where in rural communities they make a conscious effort. And there is a effort between a school system and a county and a community college and maybe a four-year institution and a business community that they put these issues on the table. We don't want to lose our best and brightest, but we want them to have opportunities. How can we give them a pathway from their school to a community college to a job that is going to be here? So maybe they want to go to Harvard and then move to San Francisco and never come back. But if they want to um, be a production manager in the local plant, we're going to figure out a way for them to do that. That seems I'm mean, ambivalent on a lot of this because they're cross currents, but that sounds right to me. For those very reasons, I think it's important to just recognize that this term brain drain is something that with just a little bit of, of context, we can all understand what that means. But as we move forward with the conversation about rural education and rural com communities, I would really challenge us to rethink that. Um, first of all, I, th I think it's, um, it, it, it it indicates that the smart people leave, and if you're not smart, um, mm. you're, you stay in the town. Mm. 
And, um, and that's bothersome at, at the core. Um, so I think in the coming months, it'll be really important to identify what is a vibrant small community? What is a vibrant rural community? Um, is it one that has great infra infrastructure? Um, is it one that has enhancements in its downtown? Is it one that's not considered a, a, a food desert? Um, is it one that has great people who rally around the community and, and have a shared set of values? Um, is it a community that has a few entrepreneurs and some small industry or small manufacturing that provide a few opportunities for folks to keep the community maybe not the same, but growing at a, at a reasonable pace to keep it, to maintain its ruralism. So going forward, I just, uh, you know, I, I just think it's going to be really important for us all to push those boundaries and to rethink if you're staying in a rural community, it doesn't mean that you weren't good enough to leave. And as long as we perpetuate that, um, I think we, we may continue to run in, or continue to run in to reasons to think that rural communities are less than an urban or a suburban community. And so just, just rethinking, reshaping that. And then um, um, a final thought on that, you know, Wyoming sees some, some moderate growth and uh, overall uh, in terms of student population and some communities, some districts more than others. And um, in my heart of hearts, I, I know that it's jobs, community, and great schools that bring people to communities. And it's those same three factors that keep people in communities. It's jobs, great communities, or excuse me, great people and great schools. And so, um, you know, figuring out how we can talk about rural education in the context of the, the jobs and in context of the shared value system and see all three of those as strengths and as pillars of what makes a rural community successful. Um, I think that's a big paradigm shift for all of us to think about, but a really important one. Yeah, really appreciate that, and I think brings that, you know, one of the things I think we're trying to think about in the education and society <coughs> program is recognizing education sits in society, and how do we need to be thinking more about how schools relate to, to community, um, just to the, to, to the other resources that, that families are looking for that are going to be important for young people's development. So appreciate that reframing. I'm going to ask just a couple more questions and then invite people uh, into the broader conversation. But you know, I started saying one of our areas of focus is equity. And I'm just curious, how have you seen equity show up? And how have you seen unique uh, approaches to addressing equity uh, in, in rural schools, rural communities? So that's to, to anyone. I will start. Um, I think, again, once I had that, that uh, aha moment, and, and I have a, a state superintendent student cabinet that informs me significantly. I have a group of 20 young people that meet with me every quarter um, for a full day. We meet for seven and a half hours a day, and their range, age ranges from fourth grade until seniors in high school, which means they stay on with me after they graduate and go on to whatever they choose. One of the things that, that they brought to my attention was uh, dealing with uh, your opportunity desert. Um, they shared with me, they, they enlightened for me that these students that are in our smaller rural school districts versus our 18 larger school districts, that they felt very, that they had tapped out of all their opportunities to take a dual credit course or a, um, an AP course, and they had felt that they, had, they want as much opportunity as their counterparts in our larger school districts to earn as many college credits. And I realized that there were a lot of things in the way of that. And so I have to give them full credit for them informing me of what, of what they clearly identified as, as a significant inequity issue. And so we set to work with our legislature and some private public partnerships to, um, to ensure that our students uh, um, in our smaller school districts, our rural school districts, had the same access to all of our AP exams as well as some dual credit courses. The other thing that, that they enlightened me about is once we crossed that hurdle, um, uh, the, the student cabinet informed me that some of their classmates, some of their peers, had, would sit through the entire AP course and then never sit for the exam. So they would take the entire AP course, but they wouldn't sit for the exam because mm -hmm. they just didn't feel that um, they could go ask their parents or their family for that $80, $90 exam fee. And so that was, again, another problem to be solved. And so we worked with the state legislature, and the legislature committed to 
in 2015 to provide uh, the, the testing fee for every single North Dakota student uh, for at least one AP exam in math, science, English, or computer science, and up to four AP exams for those uh, in low socioeconomic status. And so those are some of the equity issues. I think it's about knowing about the opportunity, knowing about the problems, and then working with uh, your partners, both public and private, to um, solve those issues. So I, I think I'll just talk a little bit about the equity commitment um, that uh, that covers valuing people and in in specifically the the pipeline for educators, and I it, it's it's interesting the book points out that uh, recruit recruitment <laughs> high quality teachers is um, is a bit different in rural communities than it is in suburban and urban counterparts, and that uh, retaining teachers uh, tends to be somewhat easier. When, a, when, when you find the right teacher in a rural community, they tend to stay there. And, um, and I, I think that that's a, a, not only an interesting little phenomenon, but one that we can really uh, go a step further and go beyond uh, it's important to build and uh, sustain a pipeline of high quality educators. But it's also really important for us to consider the implications of having that. And the implication is, is simply stability for our communities and for our students and for our schools. And um, so while that doesn't directly try, tie back to the stability, it does lend to everything that Kirsten talked about and many of the other equity commitments that we as education leaders have made um, to our students in our states or in our particular constituencies. A lot of our uh, equity work has been around early childhood education. Um, our biggest uh, success story over the past five years would be the collaborative delivery model for pre-K, in which school districts, Head Start, and private child care centers work together to create a community plan for how they're going to serve four-year-olds. So you may have uh, you have a lead partner that provides professional development. You have uh, teachers that may spend the morning in the Head Start Center and then spend the afternoon in the school district. But it's been a real game changer because it ease tension between school districts and Head Start over the fighting over the four-year-olds, just being able to say you can work together and create a community plan. Uh, some of the collaboratives are like city level, some are county level. There are all, also some collaboratives that hit like maybe three or four different counties and they're all working together to share resources. And right now the program has been very successful, although it only reaches a small number of students. So we hope to see it expand in the, in the current years. Right now we're doing a uh, advocacy campaign to increase the rate of funding for that to make sure that we can maintain the high quality because if you're familiar with the National Institute for Early Education Research, we hit uh, 10 of 10 benchmarks. They made a change and we slipped down to nine, but we're improving the access to professional development for our assistant teachers. So we hope to be back at 10 of 10 soon. And we can maintain that quality, then expand it. We think that that will be a game changer because there's no better return on investment than early childhood education. And now, I'm starting to think, should, are there other places where we should be looking at collaboration? Are there collaborators that we can create around special education? Can we create collaborators around foreign language and all the AP courses? Can we also do this around career technical? So it's really got my, my brain turning right now in terms of now that we're building these collaborators within our districts and private child care centers, can we be doing the same thing with our chambers of commerce? Should there be more partnerships between our districts and charters? So, I feel like there's a real opportunity here. Can okay, I just add one yeah. quick thing, uh, maybe to be provocative, but I think it's at least worth thinking about in terms of American pluralism. Um, if someone gets to define what the metrics and indicators of success are, you've already done the work, 90% of the work of equity. If you say that we're going to judge success by reading and math scores, then um, we're going to allow pluralism to define how they go about getting that stuff. And you know, equity is going to be whether or not there are racial or gender differences on, on those things. Um, again, the older I get, the more I recognize that pluralism requires, I think, that we have more respect for allowing different communities to decide what is important for them. Um, and so what happens if a community tells us that they are less concerned about their kids going to college and more concerned about their kids getting jobs immediately. They are less concerned about A as opposed to B. 
that they're going to define equity, equitable outcomes differently than what technocrats, central administrators like me who went to college and went to grad school would define as success. So I think part of the tough thing about equity is recognizing who defines what success is, is often people like us in this room. Raise your hand if you went to and graduated from a four-year college. Okay, um, like 100%. Um, uh, in America, it's uh, north of a third. We do not represent America, and we do not have a monopoly on the good life or the vision of the good life. Other people have that as well. And so um, I just know that when I was in Somerset County or Baltimore City or uh, Garrett County when I was the board chair in Maryland, there were some similarities, but there were some differences too in how they defined what their goals and aspirations were. Um, and I think equity has to come second after allowing communities to define in some way what they view as success. Well, and I'll say I think the, the equity okay. conversation is getting more complicated because right for some time it was you know equity was right we've set you know a definition of success and how do we get everybody to get to that same single definition and I think it's much more contested space about equity is also partly about the agency of communities and how do communities own these things so thinking about how to get the best of both of those things because going too far in either direction uh, you know letting folks um, you know, sort of be completely isolated from any sort of broader definition of, of outcomes doesn't seem uh, sort of a, a great solution, but but also saying we figured it all out and you just need to implement our plan <laughs> certainly isn't equity either. So it feels like that, that conversation is kind of maturing. Agreed. Um, so listen, I have more questions. I actually want to see, uh, are there things that you want to ask about? Or and, and so we've got one right here. If you'd wait for the microphone, um, and if you just introduce yourself, let us know where you're from and then... Uh, what, what you want to know from the conversation. I am Sarah Sneed, the new president and CEO of the NEA Foundation here in Washington, D.C. And my question is relative to what you see, panel, as trends in philanthropy and philanthropic investments in education in rural contexts. Thank you. I think we're smiling because we had a little conversation yeah, about this. You missed, that, you missed our soapbox about that. Um, was, uh, well, and so I'll, I'll take that part. And then if you guys want to reflect a little bit about where, where you see philanthropy showing up, we, did, we, had, we had a conversation about, frankly, uh, you know, philanthropy has played a very significant role in education and education policy, uh, certainly in the last, you know, 15 and 20 years. And there was a sense that, um, that uh, rural communities were not a priority there, that rural communities were very much downstream of, of sort of needing to implement things uh, that uh, philanthropy and policymakers had gotten together and decided ought to happen, um, and not a whole lot of direct investment was just one, one sort of thing that folks reflected on. But where are you seeing uh, philanthropy uh, making investments that advance rural education or that create complications that then you're needing to figure out how to manage through? I'll, I'll start with that. Um, we have a great example in Wyoming, and, uh, and it's a public-private partnership and, and a successful public-private partnership that's been in existence for a while. And it's around uh, building the capacity of high-quality teachers through the National Certified um, Board process. So the, the process, or excuse me, the funding is a match, uh, and, and it's with uh, philanthropy. And we take cohorts of, of teachers that want to go through the National Board process. And they're incentivized for going through, incentivized for passing their national boards, and then incentivized every year that they stay in their district. And then once the school, once a school, any school, gets up to a certain percentage of teachers that are um, nationally certified, then the school also receives a, a financial incentive. And so without having to go to a four-year institution um, or having to leave the teaching profession, Teachers are able to, to hone and perfect their, their skills through the national board certification process and, um, and get paid for it uh, through a public-private partnership. And so that's a, a very localized example. And um, you know, of course, we would, we would love to see um, some different options for, um, for, for funding. Uh, but, but again, looking at how traditional education funders have funded education, it, it can't just be overlaid onto rural education and into rural communities. It needs to look really different. 
And, uh, and I'm really grateful for, for this book because I think it provides a really wonderful foundation and opportunity for us to begin having some of those conversations about philanthropy and how to really uh, maximize every dollar that, that uh, could potentially go toward rural education. I would just add to that a little bit. I think it's my biggest challenge. Uh, I would say significantly it's my biggest challenge. As, as Andy said, there's not a lot of think tanks in North Dakota, but shocker, there's not a lot of philanthropic organizations in, in the upper Midwest either, or in probably the Deep South. And so, and it, it, we're not a large, large group, we're, but we're a large in numbers nationwide, but there's my, sub, my largest subgroup in North Dakota are the Native American students. They comprise 10% of my students' population. But with that being said, that's 13,000 students. When, when investors and philanthropic uh, donors are looking at moving things, they want to have a big needle moved and they want to see yeah. some pretty fast change. And, and when we're talking about rural education, uh, we need to, uh, it, it isn't that swift and it isn't that smooth and, and maybe it's not even that sexy, I don't know. But to <laughs> us, it's, it's our issue. Um, I would argue on that side too, it's like pockets of success have been happening throughout the nation. But when you have an opportunity to work with a single state, I mean, how many opportunities with an initiative can you say we move the entire state? And in what, I think that's one of the assets of being North Dakota is we are one community with a really long Main Street. The bureaucracy is, is almost minimal. I mean, it, it's minimal if not, not just absolutely easy to cut through with a, 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 with a butter knife um, through a stick of butter. And so there are some advantages to um, investing in, in that type of opportunity, but it is a challenge. It just doesn't seem to garner the attention and or the, the, the importance that it really, really needs to be. So again, I am grateful too for this book to really elevate it again, and I hope that it doesn't fall off the radar. I will say it's hard. It is hard, and maybe that's why sometimes you get spurts of energy and momentum, and then people understand the complexity and the, 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 the diversity of it, and then it's like, oh, I'm gonna move on to something else. So uh, I hope that this isn't one of those jump starts of momentum that we can continue to have people interested and become um, supportive of this idea. Yeah, can I just, oh, to be direct about this, uh, this is an, uh, an answerable question. I don't know what it is, but my hypothesis is we would be um, staggered if we saw how much private money goes into New York City public schools per year and Chicago and Los Angeles um, uh, compared to North Dakota or Wyoming. I wouldn't be surprised that if the private money going into some big urban school districts is more than the public money going into some um, small rural districts. Okay, so why? One is maybe the proximity thing I talked about earlier. Uh, that's where the money is, and that's what people see, and they want to give locally, and there's great need in these communities. I get that. The other thing that I often talk to about with philanthropists, and I've been trying to raise money for these kinds of things for five, six, seven years, and it's been a struggle. It's scale. If you're a philanthropist and you want to affect 100,000 kids, you could work through the New York City public school system one school system and affect 10 times that number. They have about a million kids. Or Los Angeles and affect seven times that. They have about 700,000 kids. Or Chicago, four times that number. How many school districts would you have to work through in North Dakota or Wyoming to affect 100,000 kids? 160. That are spread far and wide. And so I think a lot of philanthropists, not unreasonably, would say, I only have so much staff, I only have so much money if I want to get the highest return on my investment. The biggest bet is to do the scale thing. Mm -hmm. And I have not yet come up with an answer for philanthropists for that thing, other than saying, I'm sorry, scaling looks differently if you're in rural America. But one of the challenges, though, is a lot of these foundations swoop in to try to just drop off money as opposed to who's doing the work on the ground right now. How do we build that capacity? Because there are folks here that are ready to do the work. You just give them the, you just give them the money. Like, they'll do it. I think in the past, there have been a lot of foundations that have put money into Mississippi, put money in the Delta, but just dropped the money off and left. It didn't mm -hmm. stay to stick around to see who's going to be doing the work. And then a few years later, you, you look and see, well, we put all this money and we don't see any changes, so we're not going to give any money anymore. Um, the work that we do with Mississippi First, we also had sex ed, teen health as a big part of our work. And we recently spun that off to create a separate organization that works exclusively on teen health, rights, respect, and responsibility. And it's interesting to see the differences in 
the educating funding community and the teen in the health funding community. I see with education, a lot of funders go wherever the money already is. Hey, this seems like a welcoming environment because there are already all these foundations here. So let's go where the folks are. In health, I see a lot more folks who are willing to say, where is the need? And there have been a couple of national foundations that have looked at Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. Like, this is where our crisis is. So let's see who's doing work there. And it started off with one grant, then another, then another, of folks saying, these are the folks on the ground doing the work, so let's invest in them. I'm hoping at some point that the education funding community will learn from the health funding community and that people will pay more attention to us in Mississippi. So if you know of anybody. <laughs> just... All right, so we'll take a question over here in just a second. But I just want to ask you, Andy, I want to make sure I clarify from earlier, were you saying you think there ought to be a rural, uh, uh, an education policy agenda for rural, or you're saying actually it's too disparate, too, too diverse? Uh, which I, I actually, because I wonder if that's a, an area where there ought to be philanthropic support. Yeah, so I do think that there should be an overall, I think organizations that do education reform work nationally should have, should be clear about what their goals are and their strategies for doing rural work. Uh, now, if you're going to be doing work in Appalachia and the Deep South and the Northern Plains, you probably need to uh, separate that and have some different strategies. Uh, what I've, uh, I'm less certain about is if you just say, I want to have, do teacher quality stuff nationally, I want to do standard stuff, high quality tests, and a little bit of choice. And then you try to say, yeah, we're going to do rural as well as that. That's when it becomes super complicated because the choice strategy in cities looks a whole lot different than a choice strategy in rural, um, and so on. That's a good way to say that. So we're right here, and we'll try and get uh, as many as we can. We feel right Hi, my name is Silas Kulkarni. Um, I'm the president of Teaching Lab. Uh, we, we support teachers to improve their instruction, particularly in underserved communities. Um, my, my question for the panel, particularly um, for the state folks on the panel, um, what are you doing right now to empower local educators and to draw on that resource? Because one of the things that you know, we experienced, we were, our initial work was in West Virginia and Louisiana, and what we found was that there were these amazing educators out in the field who, if we could give them a little bit of um, support, a little bit of uh, spark to their, uh, their gasoline, they could take off with it in a way that was totally different than in some of the uh, urban places where there is this initiative fatigue. And so I'm kind of curious, have you worked on drawing out teacher leaders and what have been the results of that? So I think that's a great, a great, great point. And those teachers, I mean, boots on the ground, as we call them in North Dakota, are our, they, they are our army. I couldn't do the work or anything that I do in North Dakota without them. I have a great relationship with our teachers association, the North Dakota United, and their leaders. And so our state education department and our teachers association partner a lot on lifting up the stories of educators and helping share, bringing them together in those regional pockets. It's you know much too challenging to bring them to the center to one location. So we partner a lot with them to to do the professional development and even just just even statewide, sometimes even virtual book reads. But to left to 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 your point of lifting up that teacher leader, um, working with our governor right now to get some appropriation to really intently pay those teachers for. Um, leaving the classroom at some point in time, being, you know, becoming those teacher instructional leaders so they don't have to do that and take, take care of a class of 25, 30 students. And so really our, um, so we're, we're almost at the finish line. Our budget is being discussed back in North Dakota right now. So um, keeping your fingers crossed for that. But it is one, of, we call it the TILD program, um, teacher instructional leadership. And so I think those types of efforts are extremely important. The other thing that I think we need to look at in rural communities and rural context is instead of trying to draw people that had never lived in that community before, providing those opportunities, those pathways, and those supports for them to become a teacher because they're already in that community. And again, great partners, our Teachers Association and our Governor's Office are great partners on that. Yep, and I, IRA addressed how, how we have the cohort for board certified teachers, which is wonderful. But in addition to that, we have a number of structures that are set up in, in rural communities and, and larger communities across Wyoming. First of all, we, we tend to have higher salaries than our neighboring states. And um, our, we give teachers some of the highest salaries in the nation. So it's a, it's a, it's a good living for teachers. Some of our rural communities also incentivize master's programs by maybe giving time off or reimbursements, et cetera. Um, and then, you know, 
as a, as a state superintendent, and, and I think Kirsten would probably say the same, we, we don't ever have the luxury of making policy decisions in a vacuum or unilaterally or just with other policymakers. And people are um, our, our most important and well-informed and expert um, constituency that, that we tap into on a regular basis for policy work, for standards work, for, um, for feedback on, on different, um, different federal requirements that come down the pike, uh, for service on boards and commissions in our state. And so teachers very, very much have a voice, um, and, and it's a small pool you know, of, of thousands, maybe a few more than that, but uh, it's, it's a small pool, and, uh, and not only do they just have the, the authentic voice of, of a teacher expert, but also a voice at the policy table on a pretty regular basis. And I think that that just empowers the whole system to know that it's, it's at least in part being driven by teachers, the boots on the ground, as Kirsten said. I wanted to point out one big challenge that we have around teacher certification in Mississippi, um, and that's around the Praxis exam. And we're having a major issue with teachers that are finishing four-year programs, not able to pass the Praxis, and not being able to become a licensed teacher. Um, that is a big problem with African-American teachers, where 38% of them are not being able to pass the Praxis. Now, part of that is because they've done everything that was asked of them through their K-12 program, but when you go to college unprepared, and then you're education prep program doesn't prepare you and your courses aren't aligned to what you need to know to pass the practice, that's a bigger issue. So right now what we're looking at along with creating opportunities for teachers to become leaders without necessarily going into administration, we're trying to figure out what are some ways that we can get around uh, that hurdle to make sure the teachers that have proven themselves in the classroom can get certified while on the other end making sure that our programs are actually preparing people for what they need to know to be successful uh, with that licensure requirement. Great. Um, so right up here. Hi, my name is Barbara Michaelman, um, proud rural graduate from Pennsylvania. Mm. So uh, I'm trying to give context for this question short so I can get to the state leaders, but I think context is important. Um, I went to a really small undergraduate school in Pennsylvania, and then I went to one of the largest uh, public schools for my graduate program. And um, I went back and volunteered at my little undergraduate program, and I was really struck by how the liberal arts, I'm a journalism grad, I run my own communications firm now. I was really struck by how rural kids, because the school where I went is still, all these years later, first generation to college, like I was. Um, I was really struck by how the professor from the College of Liberal Arts was talking to potential students. And I felt um, I had to sit on my hands and bite my tongue because I really felt like uh, she was really limiting the opportunities for what these students could be and what they could do with their degrees. So I'm a storyteller, that's what I do for a living. Um, my career brought me here to DC in the 90s and my journalism degree has taken me places I never thought I could go as a rural kid. And um, you know, when I look at trends, when we talk about soft skills and we talk about important skills that are needed, critical thinking, problem solving, excellent communication skills, that's what I got and that's what I've put to use ever since. My dad was really worried that I would be a waitress with student loan debt and never be successful with a journalism degree because he was first generation off the farm. So he never lived to see the successes that I've enjoyed, um, but I'm sorry for all this context, but what I'm getting to is I'm on a fact-finding mission and I would love to know what you think about this. I've talked to the superintendent at my rural high school. I've talked to the incoming dean of that undergraduate program. I've talked to the English department chair, one of the journalism professors, and I'm seeing some really interesting trends emerging. And I'm perceiving a bias that rural kids are not being told that liberal arts programs can take them places. And so it's a thesis that I have that I'm working through right now. I feel like so many of these rural kids um, are being pushed into STEM. And so I'm just wondering what happens to the kids who want to pursue liberal arts 
what are your thoughts about what's happening in your states with how we talk to prospective high school graduates in rural areas about what um, someone who's really good at debate or someone who loves to write and what that can do for them. Um, are, we, are we disproportionately sending kids toward career tech? So I'm, I'm sorry for that long piece, but I wanted to give a little bit of context for my question. I appreciate that very much. I, I think that there is um, some, some, some merit to your concern. I'll tell you that in North Dakota, we have adopted what we call choice ready for that very thing. Um, we did not want to track students, and we wanted them to be choice ready, which means um, in our in our choice ready chart, it's the measuring of the count the quality of our high schools, not the quality of our students, but making sure that our high schools were preparing our students for whatever they chose to be. Uh, to Andy's point earlier, and that in order for we are measuring the growth model of the quality of our schools based on how many different areas um, that that high school can prepare that student. Because even though an 18-year-old, my 18-year-old, when uh, he, my 26-year-old, he was just going to go and become a lineman, an electrical lineman, and so that's what he knew he was going to do when he was 18 years old. And then he figured out that you know most of the time those linemen called climb those poles and you know 40 mile an hour blizzards and that's not something he wanted to do. So even though at 18, that's what he was going to do, we needed to prepare him for his choice. He went back on his bachelor's degree, his communications, that type of thing. So need to do that. So we, we recognize our expectation that um, we should, um, the expectation that we need to, to prepare them for choice. And we have a whole matrix accountability framework set up to measure where those kids are at. I think you touched a bit on career advising. I think so many of our students decide at eighth grade, we check in with them at eighth grade and say, what do you want to be? I want to be an engineer. And then we get them ready for their first four years of high school. We never really check in with them again. Um, but we have required now what's called a rolling four-year plan. So at the end of their freshman year, we check in with them again. An adult, any adult, or a designated adult has to check in with each and every one of our students in our schools in North Dakota and say, do you still want to be an engineer? Well, then you need to take this your sophomore year, your junior year, your senior year, and your first year out of school, you need to do this. We do that at the end of every subsequent year to make sure that we are preparing them. We found that those that said they wanted to be engineers really weren't taking the advanced math classes that they needed um, because no one ch checked in with them again. I think you touch on another thing about the liberal arts and the well-rounded education. I think uh, Title IV uh, dollars, the increase in Title IV dollars have provided us a lot of opportunity. I think states really need to keep their eye on the ball about if that does mean the arts, if it does mean career and technical, if it does mean engineering. I, the, the final thing that I heard you touch on that I think is important in this conversation is, is probably my second passion, and that is the increase of civics and the understanding of civics. I was a library media specialist, a school librarian, and we were teaching about fake news before fake news was a thing. We just called it <laughs> media literacy. And so um, I, I think that it's very important that we, um, civil discourse is something that we don't really know a lot about, or we are not practicing. We probably know a lot about it. Our students aren't seeing it. And so I think if we, if we truly are going to have equity, I've talked to Ross about this a lot, if we truly are going to have equity, we are going to need to teach our first graders, our kindergartners, how to have civil discourse and how to engage before it gets to protest, how to engage in the entire civic process before you reach the level of protest. So. Yeah. I want to steal that program too. Quentin, where is your? Yes, I'm Quentin Wilson. I was the commissioner of higher education accidentally in Missouri. <laughs> and uh, I, I wish we had coordinated better between K-12 and higher ed back then. But uh, there are two issues, really piggybacking on that issue, but also going back to what, Kirsten, I think you're doing in North Dakota with your cabinet, your yeah. student cabinet. Uh, we went out, and it also ties into this issue about the differences between the areas. We did interviews because we noticed that the kids were coming for one year into higher ed and then they weren't making it. So we started going back and figuring out where's the pipeline leaking. Well, it mm -hmm. turned out it was leaking based on these uh, interviews with a lot of kids between seventh and ninth grade. So, yeah. but in the course of interviewing these kids, we found in, in, in city, urban core, suburban districts, and in a rural district, Carothersville in the north end of the Delta mm -hmm. in Missouri, we have part of the Delta in oh, yeah. They were having the same problems. They weren't being, they said nobody talked to them about careers. They may have had to fill out a list, but nobody, 7th, 9th, or 11th, remembered anybody talking about careers or, or higher ed, the different kinds of higher ed, career and tech ed, uh, 
tradition, a two-year, four-year. So we're trying to figure out how to do this. Well, uh, we were also asking the kids what to do. And this ninth grade young man in Carothersville schools, at the end of our focus group said, well, could we do this again? Said, do this, you wanna do a focus group again? <laughs> but we, we got thinking about that. What, what does that mean? And we talked to more of the kids and they, we turned this into a program that's now national that we handed off to the <coughs> folks who run Gear Up, if you know that program, mm -hmm. um, where the kids do all the work. First of all, I like that a lot. Don't have to do so much work. The seventh, seventh to eighth graders do this kind of work. But uh, that, that le led me to first that there's not, at least in this particular example, there weren't met much, there weren't many differences between urban, suburban, and rural. But also, most importantly, listening to kids because there are lots of differences and different things, and talking to them. You, you, one of your questions, I think, it was um, that you started with, you know, "Have you heard?" And I think that's a real important thing. And I'm interested in what you did do with your cabinet, and, and what others have done, just in terms of getting the voice of of the uh, of the student in this process. Just real briefly, um, yes, my student cabinet has been the most amazing. Um, event or a project that I've worked on, I realized, um, as Ross had mentioned early in his introduction, I had started out as a, a teacher's aide working my way through college and then a classroom teacher, building level um, <laughs> leader, district leader, and then a school board president in the um, district right across the river where I was raising my children. I realized that in each of those roles, every day I made a decision, I could go back into that environment and see the impact that that decision was made had had made on our students, whether it be the classroom or the building or the district, when I went to the state superintendent role, that was gone. And I hung out with adults all day long. And there were other, there were other, there were opportunities for me to meet with uh, administrators and parents and legislators and teachers. There was no vehicle, so I created the state superintendent's cabinet. Um, they serve for an 18 month term. They don't need a referral. They don't need a recommendation. They apply themselves because what I didn't want to have is like a, a student council where I you know, was juggling problems about, I think someone in uh, the session that I presented described that they ended up with the students having problems of how do I juggle all five of my AP classes and still get to swim class on time or swim practice on time. So it's, it's, it's a non, non they, they apply themselves and I have them write just a very <coughs> simple uh, answer to a question, what do you think your state superintendent should know? about your school experience, and she doesn't. And so from that, from that essay, I, I, it's, a, it's a diverse group, north, south, east, and west, large, medium, and small, small as Jillian said we call our schools in, in North Dakota. They meet with me for a, uh, about six and a half, seven hours every quarter. They create the agenda. Several policies have resulted, and some appropriations have resulted from their ideas. So I would encourage, student voice is, is incredibly, the, the most shocking um, thing that I, uh, the most shocking response is when they find out that it's fourth graders all the way up to freshmen in college. Or, um, but the collegialness and, and the, the, the leaning in that they all do with each other, do not discount that 10-year-old's voice. Because okay. I think we're gonna have time for one more question uh, right back here in the back. I will just say, as, you, as you're going over there, I mean, just connecting these last two questions, you know, just the idea of counseling uh, also. I mean, so yes, absolutely, listen to student voice, but. You know, I know. I think most of this data came probably from urban districts, but right, the ACLU put out a report recently about the number of schools that have uh, armed uh, police officers, or you know, uh, and don't have a counselor. It's kind of amazing. And so, just thinking about, I wonder in rural the, the the challenge of obviously having all of that expertise in all of those remote communities, but whether technology and men distance mentoring could be something. Uh, that, that starts to take hold. But it's gonna be our- Russ, uh, could I add sure, just one more we'll thing to one. that? Um, yeah. uh, you know, I, I, just building off of that, a couple of things that we're doing in Wyoming that I think are, are really beneficial to our rural communities. First of all, as a state, one of the professional development opportunities that we offer is um, a certification in career and college counseling. And we really, really try to encourage counselors and just teachers, paraprofessionals and other other building professionals um, to take that and to, uh, to uh, get that credential. And um, I, I think it's a little backwards that we only expect the counselors to be talking to our students about career college, military choices after high school, because some of that liberal arts um, expertise or interest or passion lies in the faculty or in the staff. And so to empower faculty and staff, again, especially in smaller communities to have those conversations is really important. 
Also, we only have one four-year university in Wyoming, and so a goal that we've really set is to make sure that every student has multiple opportunities through their K-12 career to, um, to, visit, to, excuse me, to visit and have conversations with higher, higher education, and in particular, our four-year university. Again, really having an opportunity from someone who's very biased and very subjective about their passion or about their career, being able to just impart that and share that with students. So um, I don't just think that it's, it's the student voice. I think it's really empowering um, a diverse faculty and a diver the, the diversity, or I guess maybe engaging the diversity in a community. Even the smallest of communities has a, a diverse voice about next steps after high school and engaging that. And, um, and just putting that forward for students is important. Thank you. Okay, last question. Right okay, um, really quick comment on the high graduation rate, low college attainment front. Um, I am a regional economist for the Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond, but until really recently, I was a professor for 17 years in Tennessee and South Carolina. And one of the things in the Deep South that we've seen over the past few years is a lot of the states had graduation exams, which I'm not necessarily a fan of, but they had these graduation exams. The rural students, which also in the Deep South tend to be the more diverse students, were having trouble passing the exams, so they just did away with the exams. Graduation rates have gone through the roof but none of the other outcomes have changed much. And in some states like South Carolina, it is actually illegal to remediate students in higher ed. You cannot offer a remedial math or reading class in higher ed. So we're letting more students out of high schools, but we, and, and at the college level, we absolutely saw a little change in quality, right? More people are graduating, more people are going to college, but we can't remediate them in any way. So of course they don't persist at the rates of the students who could have passed that graduation exam before. So it's not really a surprise, I guess, is my point. Um, but one of the questions I had, um, so some recent research I've done shows that in um, the rural areas of the Deep South that teacher quality matters a lot more in the rural areas than it seems to matter in urban areas. And I think it gets to the multiple roles that teachers are playing. So I was curious, especially for Sanford, since you're from a state not far from me, what are you doing to recruit and retain teachers? What do you see being done in these rural areas? Because it's so hard to get quality teachers to stay. A and lot we'll of anybody, Sanford, you're going to kick us off. Anybody last remarks, then we'll close with Sure. It. A lot of the activity in Mississippi recently has been around you know, housing allowances, tax credits, and stuff like that. I don't know how far that goes. Uh, because, you know, the number one thing is to have a high quality principal there and someone who will create an environment that you'll actually want to stay in. Like, that's, that's what really makes a difference. Uh, beyond that, we're actually going to start work on a study of our teacher pipeline throughout the state of Mississippi. We want to have that report out in 2021, but I'm in the process of creating a teacher advisory group to help inform every decision that we make throughout this process. So I will have a much better answer for you in two years because we don't really know yet, but that's what we're going to be focusing on. By the way, another opportunity for philanthropy in a rural context, if anybody <laughs> is listening. Talk to me now. Good plug, Ross. Um, again, thank you to Aspen Institute and everyone in this room, and um, to Andy, who worked so hard on this book project over the last couple of years. And I hope that this just blows the doors right wide open on um, having some really deep conversations about rural, rural communities, strengths and challenges in rural education. Um, I will also say, you know, I truly believe that it's jobs and communities and people. Uh, those are the heart of, of every community, but especially small communities. And um, in Wyoming, it's sometimes weather that can keep people away. And I just got a notice that school is canceled at home because of a blizzard. So <laughs> I'm glad I'm here. I'm going to go for a run after this. <laughs> I, too, would like to thank that bringing attention to this very important issue. I will just um, say I believe that it, it Sanford said principal is the key to retention. Mm -hmm. If you have a good quality leader, you will stay. Um, I would say the other about the recruitment. I would say, again, it's about the opportunity desert. We need to have the people that are great, solid community people within those communities bring the opportunity to them to become a teacher instead of forcing them to move 300 miles away in order to do that. Uh, real, real quick story, promise to, to end this, because it was one of the most um, important 
anecdotes, moments of my young building education policy career. Um, I was in my 20s and I was advocating in a state for a charter school law. And we thought we had all the votes lined up in the House of Delegates and in the State Senate. But it turned out that we were one vote short in the State Senate. And there was one Republican member who was not going to vote for this bill, we found out. So I cornered this guy after a session and hectored him all the way from the chamber, all the way back to his office, um, talking to him about the needs of, this was in Maryland, the needs of Baltimore's kids. I was talking to him about civil rights and social justice and opportunity and these kids and the history of segregation in Baltimore and the great need. And he kept getting angrier and angrier and angrier at me. As I mean, I thought I, I was sure I was on the side of the angels as I was pestering him until finally in the hallway of his building where his office was, he turned around and screamed at me, what about my kids? But he added a dirty word in there too. Um, but the point of this was, I knew nothing about him. I knew nothing about his very rural district. I knew nothing about their poverty and what they were suffering. I was talking to him on a social rights, civil justice issue about someone else's kids. And he asked me a completely fair question that haunts me as I do all education policy today. Everyone engaged in public education has the right to ask, what are you policymakers doing to help my kids, the kids that I care about and love the most? He wasn't saying don't care about other people's kids. I had not thought through what it means for his very poor town in Western Maryland when I was making a pitch to him. So my pitch to all of you as we're doing our education policy work, if a rural person says to you, what about my kids? Do you have an answer for them? All right. The book is no longer forgotten. Uh, an important contribution to an important conversation. Thank you all for joining today. And thank uh, join me in thanking them. Thanks, Thanks guys. Good job. Good job. Good job. Good job.